All right, so um, for the next couple weeks, maybe four weeks, I guess I'll be teaching your guys' class. And um, what I'm wanting to do is uh, go through and have a, have a series of discussions on the seriousness of life, on serious life. And so some of you probably already know these things, or some of them, and maybe some don't. So we'll just talk about them and try to look and see what, um, what is valuable in that, because I think that's a valuable thing to learn. So that, as I look back and, and think about what I wish people would have told me when I was your age, that was one of the things, there's a number of things about on this subject that I wish people would have told me, so I'm going to tell them to you. You can do with them however you want. Yeah, that's fine. Alright, so the premise of the whole idea, or the whole the whole series of talks that I want to do with you guys, is that life is extraordinarily serious. And it's at all ages. Um, and you don't need you don't need much evidence to know that that's the case, except to realize that nobody is going to make it out of life alive. <clears throat> Everybody's going to die, and they die at all ages. So you know, you, if you ever want to see just how serious life is, you can go to like St. Jude's Children's Hospital. You'll find out that it doesn't matter how old you are; life can be very, very serious, even at a very young age. And it's not the way we normally think about things. As we're young, we tend to think that. I think that we. I think that the that the, that the, the normal concept is, and, and it, it's probably just an intuitive way of looking at it, is that you almost like have two lives. You have a life when you're young that you get to enjoy, and then at some point you like have a life that's serious. And and the idea I think that too many people have is that is that um, there's like this step, right? You like graduate into a different life. And that life is going to be serious, and you can leave behind everything you've done or whatever your life was up until that point. You can just that stays behind, and then you go in and like now it's for real. So you get a life that's fun, and then you get a life that's serious. And it doesn't work that way at all. It's an it's an incredible um, uh, misunderstanding or misrepresentation of of how life is. And this is a lot of this has to do with because we live in a in a. Um, how would I put it? We live in a world that makes that that hides the seriousness of it. It hides the dangerous the danger that life actually is. The the incredible um, um, de uh, deathly seriousness that life is. It blends it over because we live in, a, in an incredibly comfortable time. So if you and I live, if you and I live back say 200 years ago, well at our age we would know this without a doubt. I mean, at our age, you would already be like have your own farm, and you'd already have your own. You, most of us would already have like children, and we would already have our own house, and all these things. We'd be incredible. And it, it, it isn't because people have have evolved or devolved. It's because society has made things much more comfortable. And so nowadays, you don't have to grow up ever. You can like be a kid forever, right? <laughs> Until you, you're 90, you can live with your mother in the basement forever. But there was a time when that wasn't possible. And it wasn't because anyone was making that the way it is. It wasn't because society was saying, no, you have to grow up. It's because, it's because we didn't have the comforts we have now. And so, and so responsibility was put on people from the time they were very young. I mean, from the time they were like, being able to walk. They're out in the, in the fields picking cotton. Or in my case, I grew up in the north, so we didn't pick. We didn't have cotton, but we had to pick. We had to pick rocks, right? That was our. That was that was what I did when I was six years old. You had to go on the field, and there's rocks that have come up because the because of the frost pushes all the rocks out of the ground, and so every year there's like rocks everywhere out in the field, and so you got to go out and you got to pick them up and you put them on the sled, and the tractor's pulling the sled around. So I'm six years old and we're picking rocks, and that's what we did, and and that was and that was at a time when life was actually not nearly as harsh as it was, say, two generations ago, right? Um, 
And so that made everyone come to terms very quickly and at a very young age with how serious life is. And nowadays we live in a very comfortable time. And I'm not knocking that. I'm not telling you that we need to all move off to a farm and get our kids picking cotton at three. That is not what I think we should do at all. I like the world we live in. But it does mask the reality. And so you, you tend to look at the comfort of life and you think, well, this is what's real. But it really isn't. It's not real. It is a, and, and all it takes, and, and you know, but this is not something you hear a lot maybe on the news, but there is, there is, a, there is a fear in, 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 in amongst people who, say amongst scientists, that we're going to have a solar flare like what we had in the 1800s. Huge solar flare which is like a million atomic bombs detonating in our atmosphere as far as the radiation that's produced, electromagnetic radiation. And it wipes out every electronic piece of equipment in the world. And we just had one very recently, and it missed Earth by like 10 minutes. Just missed us. And we don't know when that might happen. When that happens, everything that's electronic is no longer works. Your phones, your iPads, the ATMs, every cash register, every store you buy from, everything that controls inventory, most vehicles, in fact, any vehicle made after like 1990, everything no longer works. It's like a huge magnetic field. If you put a big magnet next to your computer, that's what happens. And if something, if some event like that, or even something not nearly as catastrophic happens, all of a sudden you'll realize just how serious life can get very quickly. I remember I was in Mexico, we had a huge blackout. Uh, we didn't know it at the time, but we found out like a couple days later that it blacked out the entire country of Mexico almost. A uh, big, a big generator in Guatemala uh, blew up, and almost the entire country of Mexico blacked out. I was downtown in the city where we lived, and I was preaching downtown that night, and it all went pitch black. I mean, there was no light anywhere, and it wasn't just in that block; it was the entire city. It turns out it was like almost the entire country was black. And how quickly that city devolved into chaos. I couldn't, it was before I even got home, and it was complete chaos. People rioting and looting and fighting and murders. Everything happened almost instantaneously when the electricity went out in that city. And, and that is how close we all live, we don't realize it, right? But we all live on the razor's edge of chaos all the time. And you think, no, no, that would never happen here. It would happen so quick, so fast. And that's just one example. But your life is serious even if that never happens. You deal with life and death subjects every day, all day. And the consequences of your decisions are life and death. You just don't know it. So you get in a car and you put it in drive, and you get up on the road and you're going 50 miles an hour, that is life and death for you and everybody around you. It only takes an instant to run somebody over. And I don't mean because you're being careless or because you're driving poorly or because you're, not, you're texting or drinking around. I'm just saying that you're doing everything right and your front wheel blows out and you lose control and go over the curb and run over a woman and her baby in a carriage. That is how close you are all the time to chaos. All the time. And so to live as if that's not the case is to live in an unreal world. Now I'm not saying that we should all like, well I'm never driving again and I'm never leaving my house. Because you have those, the agoraphobes, right? That won't leave their house and it's because everywhere they look they see this reality. And you think, well those people are crazy. Actually they're not crazy. They're actually seeing all of this and they have, don't have in their brains, they don't have the coping mechanism, which is essentially being able to put yourself in the la-la land, right? It's being able to deceive yourself and say, no, 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 there, nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen. That, that is actually the craziness. Now, you all, we all need a certain level of 
insanity. If not, we wouldn't be able to cope in the world. We wouldn't be able to interact. We wouldn't be able to lead. We wouldn't be able to even speak to anybody because we would realize how, how incredibly chaotic and how incredibly dangerous even, I mean, you think, what could possibly happen? I mean, you talk to somebody. Well, what if they're infected with, say, coronavirus? I mean, you don't know who's infected. We have no idea. I just read they just pulled 12 people off of a cruise ship, 12 Americans off of a cruise ship who were infected with this virus. I was just on a cruise ship. So maybe I have it. And now you're in the same room as me. So now maybe you have it. <laughs> We have, you have to have a certain level of insanity. If not, you wouldn't be able to cope with the world. The problem is you've got to be very aware that, that, that what you're actually doing is you're ignoring reality at some level. And, there have, and so what I'm telling you is that we have to find that balance. There has to be a balance of how much reality we ignore and how much we accept. And the problem with youth, particularly, even though, it, like I say, the age of youth is getting higher and higher and higher, right? And, and, but, but the problem with youth, as, a, as, 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 a, as far as, um, as a fundamental problem of that category of people, is that they're, they ignore too much reality. All right? Now, your grandmother probably ignores too little. Right? And so they're like, oh, don't do that, you're going to... And they, you get these hover parents, and helicopter parents, that hover all over their kids, and don't want them to do anything, and that's because they see too much reality. And there's that balance you have to strike, if not, you'll never do anything. So I'm not trying to scare anybody, but I am telling you, you are dealing with life and death every day, and it's every decision you make. And I'm not just talking about danger. So we're gonna, I want to look at that, and I want to look at a couple different categories where I think you need to evaluate and see if you are properly evaluating, if you're properly discerning what is real, what reality is, and if you're really understanding just how serious your life is in these areas. So the first one I want to talk about today, we need to get to it because I'll run out of time. So the first one I want to talk about today is on money and debt. And we're going to talk about different categories. It won't be the only one. We're just going to talk about that today. Today I want to talk to you about money and debt. Because this is very, very serious. And I find that particularly among Christians, and not just you, so this, is, this is actually a topic I would like to talk to with all Christians. Because I find that almost all Christians do not understand money at all. Do not understand it. And, it's, and Jesus considered this to be a terribly bad thing. Jesus said that Christians should know how to handle money. They should. And it is a horrible thing about Christianity of our time that we know nothing about it. We're a bunch of rubes, a bunch of naive idiots when it comes to money. And that is unacceptable. It's unacceptable. And so, um, obviously, this is just like a little primer on it. It's, you, you need to look into it more. You really should do some study. Uh, if you're in school, take an economics class. It would help you immensely. Um, if you're not, you can buy the books. I mean, you don't have to go to college anymore to learn so many of these things. Many professors are offering these courses for free on YouTube and other online video, uh, Vimeo and all, the, uh, all these different ones. Right? You can go there, you can watch these, you can, you can buy the books and read them. So you don't have to be ignorant. You don't have to be ignorant. Maybe your parents didn't teach you, maybe your school didn't teach you, maybe your church isn't teaching you what they should, but you don't have to be ignorant, you can look it up. So look up the information. If you want to know some good books that will really get you started, I can give you a list of books, great books on economics and on finances. Those are not the same thing. Economics and finances are two completely different subjects, and you should study both of them, okay? Anyways, we're just going to look at a little primer course on money as I think Christians need to understand it. So the first thing you need to understand as a Christian is that money is not bad. Too many churches are teaching this nonsense that money is evil or money is bad or at least it's less good. It's not really good. It's like, ah, uh, money. It's like that. It's that necessary evil. It's not. It's not. That is in a biblical position. I can show you. You can't. No one can show me a single verse in the Bible that says that money is evil. Not one. Now there's a verse that says the love of money is the root of all evil. 
But that is not saying that money is important. Paul and Peter and James and John and all the apostles and all the prophets and Jesus all handled money. All of them. And with the exception of those who are voluntarily poor in the Bible, and there are very few of those exceptions, most of the people in the Bible were very wealthy. Abraham was extremely wealthy. Job was very wealthy. David was wealthy. Solomon was wealthy. Almost all of them were. Almost every one of them. Paul, you say, well, Paul, he lived in poverty. Well, yes and no. Yes and no. You know that when Paul traveled and preached, he traveled with a big company of people? We often think, when we picture, in fact, if you look at it in a movie, he's like walking all by himself with a little stick down the dirt road. No. No, you're not reading the epistles there. You should read the Bible more. So at the end of every epistle almost, he gives a long list of people who he says are his co-laborers. Paul traveled with a huge company of people. 20, 30, 40, 50, who knows how many. Huge company of people. And he fed them. He says that. He says, I work with my own hands and I supply my needs and the needs of everyone who goes with me. So the idea that Paul's like this beggar and he's got these torn up clothes and he, you know, he, he can barely feed himself, no, that is not at all. In fact, Paul says in the verse we like to quote, everyone likes to quote the verse says, I can do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. If you read the context, you know what he's saying? He says, I know how to have a lot and I know how to have a little. I know how to live both ways. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. What he's saying is, I can live with little because Christ strengthens me, and I can live with a lot wealthy. I can do both. He says, I've done both, and I know how to do both. And it takes knowledge. A lot of people think that what you need to know is how to be poor. Riches take care of themselves. No. No, it's not that way at all. In fact, most, the reason most people are poor today, especially in our country, is because they don't know anything about money. It is almost impossible in this country to be poor. You have to work very hard at being poor in this country. I mean, you have to work really hard at it. And I know that's not popular and it's certainly not politically correct, but it's still true. Where everywhere you look, it says, we want to pay you money for showing up today, and you don't have money, you are working really hard at not having money. Okay, so money is not... Bad. And riches are not a lack of spirituality. And the inverse is also true. Poverty is not spirituality. Too many Christians, and I grew up with Christians like this, who believe that being poor is synonymous with being spiritual. That is not true. It's not true. And it may sound true. It may be intuitive. You may intuitively think it feels true. It's not true. It's a lie. It's a myth at the best. It's a lie, in my opinion. It just is not true. Now, I'm not telling you that to be spiritual, you have to be rich. But let's think about that for a second. There are places, in fact, there's an old philosopher, Roman philosopher, long, long ago, named Seneca. You might know him. You might have read some of his things. But Seneca, as a Roman philosopher, this is one of his very famous sayings. He said, in a corrupt society, it is a shame to be wealthy. In a honest society, it is a shame to be poor. It's a very smart thing to say. That There's a lot of wisdom in that statement. So there are places in the world where to be wealthy, you have to steal, you have to rob, you have to break the law, you have to be crooked, you have to be corrupt. And there, honest people are going to be poor. There are places like that in the world. I've actually lived in places like that. So I'm not trying to be judgmental against everybody everywhere and across all time saying if they're poor, that's because they're worthless. That's not what I'm saying. There are, for most of human history, poverty was a reality. And it had nothing to do with hard work. You could work your whole life and never own anything. For slaves, for indentured servants, for things like that, yes, absolutely. And I'm not criticizing that. I am talking about 2020 in America today. If you were poor, you are working hard at being so. You don't have an excuse. 
And you think, well, it's a choice. We'll get to that in a second. There is a choice of poverty that is not bad. But let's talk about this for a moment as far as poverty, riches, and spirituality and that triangle. And let's just discern for a moment. Think with me about this for an instant and see if you think that which one is closer to spirituality. If wealth or poverty is somehow related to spirituality, which one is closer related in our world, in our society, right now? So you think about that. In order to be poor today, you have to not go to work. They're paying in obscene amounts of money for people who have no skill, and all you have to do is show up on time. So you tell me, what would be the, who is the more spiritual person? The person who gets up and goes to work on time like they promised and committed to do, or the person who does not? What would be the, what would be the spiritual person? Well, I say it's a person who goes to work and gets there on time. But you know what that will result in every single time right now in San Antonio, Texas, in our year? Well, if you would just go to work every day and show up on time, it would immediately make you wealthier. Now, it's not going to make you a millionaire, but it will take you from being a dozenaire to at least being a hundredaire. So you've moved up, right? By, by a magnitude of 10, you've increased. And then, if you would not be on your phone all day, leave your phone in the locker, and actually, all the, the eight hours that you have given your word to somebody to pursue their best interest, if you would actually do that, for eight hours straight, pursue their best interest. Not think about what you want, what you're going to get, how much money you want to make, and only think about what is best for your employer, and do everything within your ability to pursue that end. Would that be spirituality, or would being on your phone and robbing time from your employer and not really paying attention, not really caring about what another person needs, which one would be more spiritual? Well, it'd be the person who's doing everything they can for somebody else. That is the essence of spirituality. But you know what that results in? An immediate increase in wealth. It's not what you're looking for. Many people have the wrong idea of wealthy people. They think wealthy people go to work to make money. And that's because they don't have this, because people that think that way don't have money. They don't understand money. Anyone who goes to work to make money doesn't make much money. It's the amazing paradox of how money works. You want to know what wealthy people go to work for? To build something. To create something. To do something. To be productive at something. To create some value for people they love and for people they don't even know. You know, you may, that may not fit the narrative you hear on TV about rich people. You think, oh, rich people, all they care about is making money. That isn't true. Maybe you should go out and meet some rich people. It'd probably do you some good to hang around some people like that. You'll find out. That isn't how they think at all. Think about it for a second. If, if right now, I mean, most, many of you probably have jobs, right? So let's say that right now, you won the lottery. $200 million. Would you ever go to work again? Would you get up the next morning and go back down to where you work? Las Palapas? And make green enchiladas? Most of us would probably say no. Think about this. Someone like Bezos or Bill Gates are worth, let's say, roughly $150 billion. Do you know what they do every morning? They get up four in the morning and you're in the office before the people who are making minimum wage and leave after them. You think they do that because they want money? They have money. You have to change the way you think about this. Christianity has done a horrible job at educating us on this issue. Horrible. And we ended up now, we have an entire generation, in fact, we have like four or five generations, as far as I can tell, of Christians who are absolutely 100% wrong on this subject. Do not listen to them. 
They do not know what they're talking about. I don't care if it's your grandfather or your father or your grandmother or your mother or if it's your uncle or your aunt or your neighbor or your pastor. I don't care who it is that is feeding you this myth. They are wrong on this. They are wrong. And if you don't think they're wrong, tell them I would love to talk to them. I'd be happy to debate them publicly. They are wrong. They may be right on everything else in life. They're wrong on this. Now, I'm not telling you that the pursuit of a Christian is to make money. I am telling you that the pursuit of a Christian is a lifestyle that in our current culture cannot do anything but make money. Now, in other cultures, that's not the case. If you live like a Christian, like where I lived when I was a young boy, you probably aren't going to be wealthy. You're probably going to be poor. Because it was a corrupt society, and if you were going to succeed, it required you to also be corrupt. But in our society, our society. If you live like a Christian, you will be wealthy. It's just a fact. Now, if you're trying to be wealthy, then you probably won't be. That's the paradox. Because that's the love of money. But I'm telling you, you need to love the attitudes, the behaviors, the spirituality which inevitably result in wealth. Inevitably. So, one of those is ambition. Ambition is a spiritual act. We a lot of times think that, that spiritual people are people that are listless. People that just like lounge around and they think about the Bible. They don't really do much. You know, they just read the Bible. And they're so spiritual. And they don't have any cares. And they don't care about anything. They're like, ah, que sera, sera. Whatever it will be, will be. And life just works it. That is not spirituality. Not. If you, if you would read the Bible, you would find out that no spiritual person in the Bible had that attitude. Not one of them. Not one of them. They were ambitious. Now, there's different types of ambition. You might have an ambition to have a big business, and that's a fair and wonderful ambition. You might have the ambition to be, uh, 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 say, say a, 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 a singer or be a sports star, or you might have the ambition that, to start a church. All of these are ambitions, and not, none of them are inherently better than another. But you need to have ambition in life, or you will be aimless. If you don't have ambition in life, you will be aimless. And, you will, and your life is going to tick away so fast. You guys are going to leave this room, go home, and when you come back the next week, it's not going to be a week from now. All of a sudden, you're going to look up, and you're going to be 50 years old. And then you're going to be 70 years old, and your life is over. It's going to happen so fast. You're not even going to realize where it all went. And you're going to say, I wasted days and days and weeks and months and years without any goals. Ambition is spirituality. And I don't just mean... Christian ambition. I mean, because this is the thing about ambition. It doesn't have barriers. It doesn't have fences or guard, guardrails. So when you get ambitious about something, it bleeds into every aspect of your life. People that get up early in the morning and work out tend to be better at work also because they take that attitude of getting up and doing something, they take it to work and they do it there. And then they also take it to church and they do it there. Because you don't, you, it's almost impossible to put a guardrail on it and say, this is only going to be true or only going to exist in this aspect of my life. It doesn't work that way. When you begin to develop that discipline and that attitude and that ambition, it just bleeds all through your life and it affects every aspect of your life. Now, some people have a natural drive. I know that. And some people don't. I never did. But it is something that can be learned. And for some people, it's a little harder than others. That's just life. You shouldn't have to accept it. But you need to have ambition. Ambition is, is not bad. Now, well, I'll tell you what is bad, as we're talking about money. Covetousness is evil. Covetousness is evil. What is covetousness? Anybody have, can tell me what covetousness is? No, not exactly. It's close, but not exactly. 
Anybody else? It's wanting what you don't have a right to have. You can, you can want something you see someone else having. Like if I see you have a nice car, I go, I want a nice car. That's ambition, right? So I see that somebody bought a nice house, I'm like, wow, I want to have a nice house. Now, what covetousness is, is I say, I want your house. I don't want to earn my house, I want your house. I want your wife, I want your car. I want your money. I don't want to work for it. I don't say, I want money, therefore, I'm going to work so I can earn money. No, it's, I want the money, and I want your money. I want to take from you. I don't want to earn my own. That's covetousness. People think, well, rich people are naturally covetous. No, actually, most of them are not. Most wealthy people, and, I, and again, I want to remind you, I'm talking about our society. Here in the U.S., in Texas, in San Antonio, this year, right now, most wealthy people are not covetous. Poor people are covetous. Now, this doesn't seem intuitively true, but it is true. In our society, if you are poor, you are generally living off of other people. That is covetousness. You don't have to be wealthy to be greedy. You don't have to be wealthy to be covetous. Now, I'm not telling you that no rich people are covetous. There's plenty of them also. I'm just telling you, the idea that just having money makes you covetous, that is a complete myth. It's not true. There are tons of poor people who have no money who are very covetous. So you need to abstain from that. So, when people, when Christians, and this is, this is what I say about Christians being so wrong on this subject. Christians say, well, you know, I don't, I, don't have, I don't have money because I'm content. I don't have any money because I know how to be content. That's fine. Like I said, there is, a, there is an, a, a, a voluntary poverty that there's nothing wrong with. You could say, like Paul did. Paul was apparently, you obviously, very smart, very intelligent, very capable, Right? And, and so he could have done anything he wanted in his life. He could probably have been an extraordinarily wealthy person. But he took an essentially a vow of poverty. He basically said, I'm not going to be wealthy. I'm not going to pursue wealth because I'm going to pursue the gospel. And that may cost me money. And that's fine. Well, that's fine. But you know what Paul said many times in almost every single one of his letters? He says the same thing. He says, I didn't take anything from anybody. I may not have had money, but I did not accept anything from any of you. Nobody gave me anything. If I needed to eat, I provided my own food. Now that's a strong statement. Christians need to take this part. There is nothing wrong with you saying, Mike, I don't want to be ambitious. I don't want a business. I, don't. I just want enough to live and, 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 and subsist, and I am just going to pursue God, and that's what I'm going to do. Excellent. Provided you're not living on welfare. And I mean all forms. Now, I'm not here preaching against welfare. In fact, I think that if anyone's going to get it, it ought to be Christians. Because I'm paying it, right? So I have a business, I pay a lot of taxes, I'm paying welfare. If I want someone to get it, I want it to be people I love more. That's the Christian. So I want Christians to get it. I just don't want them telling me how they're content. So that's fine. I'm not trying to make anyone feel bad if you or some family member or some friend of yours is on welfare. I don't want you to think that I'm like bad mouthing them or I don't like them or I'm saying mean things about them, you know, deriding them. That is not what I'm saying. Just don't tell me that they're content. It's not contentment when they're content with my money. That's not contentment. So just be honest about what it is and just do it. That's fine. Any Christian comes to me and says, hey, I can barely make it. I'm like, that's what their welfare is here for. Go get it. Don't be ashamed of it. Just do it. But don't tell me you're content. So I, I know Christians personally who, who, who tell me, well, I don't want to work. You know, I, they're offering me this job, but I would have to work like 15 hours a day, and I don't want to work that much, so I'm taking this other job that pays a lot less, and we'll just use welfare because we want to be content. That's not contentment. Now, if you say, 
we're going to live on less money. We're going to cut down our expenses. We're going to get rid of our phones and get rid of the TVs and get rid of everything. And we're going to live in a very small, tiny house. And we're going to eat whatever we can afford to buy with our money that we make. And we're going to be content. Now, that's contentment. And that's honorable. That is laudable. That is an amazing attitude to have. And I know people that have that. If you want to uh, uh, see an example of this, you can, like, for instance, look up uh, a famous example recently. is You can go look up Francis Chan, who's a pastor in San Francisco, and read his story. This is kind of his story. Very wealthy, wrote a book that was a New York Times bestseller, Christian book, millions of dollars, and he gives it all away. He moves his family to East Asia to go live in the slums with the people there and try to help people that are victims of sex trafficking. That's good. I'm not saying you and I have to do that. I'm just telling you, that's content. But living off of other people's money, off of welfare, off of charity, off of that kind of thing, and then saying, it's because I know how to be content, that's not contentment. It's also not contentment when you have a credit card. So if you're borrowing money to buy your food, that's not contentment. If you're borrowing money to buy a car, that's not contentment. Contentment is good, but it has to be real. Now, you don't have to be poor to be content. Paul said, I know how to be content with abundance, with great wealth, and I know how to be content with great poverty. Paul says, I have learned how to be content at all levels of that spectrum. So you can be wealthy, but you still need to know how to be content. Right. So contentment is good. Now, let's talk quickly, we're running out of time, so let's talk quickly about um, debt. Because it goes and ties in with money. Debt, and I want to deal with it separately because we live in a time of debt. I don't know if you guys know, but we have an enormous amount of debt. In fact, the public debt is almost is very small. So our public debt, or what we, you know, the the the, the, uh, the national debt they call it, it's like at, I think it's like at twenty two trillion dollars right now, something like that, right? It, that is a very small in comparison to the private debt in America. Private debt in America is several times more than that. We're talking about school debt, student loan debt, credit card debt. Un, uh, unsecured loan like cars, things like that. Mortgage debt is huge. Altogether, private debt is several times more than the national debt. We live in a society where everything is debt. Everyone is buying things on credit. Now, I'm not trying. I'm not going to tell you how you have to live. You can live your life any way you want. I'm going to give you some advice, and you take it or leave it however you want. And I come from both sides. So let me give you a little quick explanation of, of where I come from on this so you can then evaluate my, my, my advice, how you want to wait. So up until about 10 years ago, I lived with debt. We borrowed money for everything. Bought cars on debt. We bought, you know, rented houses or bought everything we did was debt. And we, up about 10 years ago, we started looking at it and we owed $60,000. Well, that's a lot of money, especially when you don't have anything to show for it. We didn't own a home, we didn't own land, we didn't own a business. This was just all debt, consumer debt. This is years of piling up, buying computers on debt, buying TVs on debt, buying clothes on debt, buying vacations on debt, and it all piles up, and all of a sudden, you're making, I was making like $10 an hour, and I was $60,000 in debt. So that's the perspective where I'm coming from. I know what it is to be in debt. Now, we got convinced by the ministry of, of, of a few people, uh, namely Dave Ramsey, particularly him, but others, including my, my dad, never lived in debt. And so, you know, we got some advice from them, and we paid off our debt. So right, for about 10 years now, we haven't had debt. So that's where I'm at. Now, I'm going to give you some advice. Stay out of debt. For the most part, in America today, debt is covetousness. So anyone who says that they're poor, therefore they're not covetous, and they're content, but they have a car that they're making payments on, 
They're covetous. They want something they can't afford. That's covetousness. There's nothing wrong with wanting something you can afford. If you can go down and buy yourself a brand new Maserati in cash without putting your family's future in jeopardy, go do it. If that's what you want, wonderful. There's nothing wrong with having nice things. Nothing. You want to go down and you want to buy yourself a lake house to go down on the weekends with your family? Great. I hope every one of you in your life are able to do that. I really do. But if you have to borrow money to do it, it's covetousness. You're wanting something you can't afford. Now that's a generalization. And there are, when, when I give, I give like a week long teaching on debt and I get more. There's, there's, I know there are some exceptions to these things. So I'm not trying to make it sound like any debt at all is pure covetousness. But in general, we did not, our country did not come $22 trillion in debt because we know how to handle money. And we're not $60 trillion in debt as a, as a nation of uh, privately consumers because we know how to handle money. And because we had some bad times. That's not what happened. I wasn't $60,000 in debt because we had medical bills, even though some of that was medical bills. That wasn't why I was in debt. I was in debt because I wanted a computer I couldn't afford. Because I wanted a car I couldn't afford. Because I wanted a lifestyle I couldn't afford. And that's covetousness. So you need to stay out of debt. And that means you should never buy a car that you can't buy in cash. I don't care how old you are. I don't care how much you think you need something or what you hear everyone telling you about you need a car that's dependable. You need a car you can afford. Save money and buy your cars in cash. You say, well, I got a job and I'll be able to make the payments. Not a big deal. Stay out of debt. Now, that is not a law. You're not in sin if you don't listen to me. This is advice. You can take it or leave it. But I'm giving you what is very sound advice. You should really think about it. There are things in your life where you will, be able, you will not be able to avoid debt. So if you, you've got kids, one of your children all of a sudden needs some type of medical procedure that is extraordinarily expensive, you might have to go into debt for that. And there's just simply, there's simply things like that that are unavoidable. That's not what we're talking about. Nine people out of ten in our country are not in debt because they had some expensive medical procedure. They're in debt because they wanted a TV that was ten inches bigger than the one they threw out in the trash. And there's nothing wrong with wanting a bigger TV if you can buy it in cash without jeopardizing your future. And that's what we work for. So I'm not telling you don't own things, don't have nice things, don't buy nice clothes. Buy anything you want provided you can afford it. And you can't afford it, you don't buy it. That's what it means to not live in debt. Now, that includes student loans. I would tell you, do not take out student loans. Think, well, i got to go to college. You can go to college without debt. I'm not telling you it's easy. I'm telling you it's possible. Now, other people tell you, no, take out the loans, you know, do it, and when you're done, you pay it off, it's low interest loans, they got all the reasons, and maybe they're right, whatever. I don't think they're right. I think you'd be far better off taking two years longer to get through college and doing it debt-free than you would be to go into debt. Now, you should really think about that. There are many options available to everybody, men and women of all ages, to be able to get a college degree Get free. It is possible. And there are lots of people in the world today who will actually help you and show you how to do it. Give you advice, show you the way to do it. They're not, there's no magic bullet to this. You are talking about working your butt off to be able to do this. You're going to be more tired than you've ever been in your entire life. But when you're done, you won't owe anything. It's a huge thing. So you need, you need to try to do everything you can to stay out of debt. Because debt will rob you of your future. You are, when you go into debt, what you are doing is you are selling your future. That's not metaphorical. 
You're literally doing this. You're saying, I want something now, and to have it now, I will give you a piece of my life to come. That is what that is. Because money is time, right? If you make $10 an hour, $10 is one hour of your life. So when you take on a debt of $300, you are, you are signing over ownership of 30 hours of your life to somebody else. They own it. Life you haven't even lived yet. Life that you don't know what you would rather be doing with it when it comes up, time to pay. You can't look at it as you're saying, well, I'm just giving over a very small percentage of my paycheck. No. How many cars would they sell on credit if instead of saying $300 a month, payment, they said 30 hours of your life a month payment. We want 30 hours of your life. They would sell a lot less cars that way. But that is exact, that's what's real. This is what I'm saying about you need to have a sense of reality. And you have to understand how serious life, life is. Dead is not a small thing. It is a huge thing. Huge thing. It is sacrificing huge portions of your life. I have friends who pay half their paycheck in a car payment, who pay 20% of their paycheck in payments on iPhones. You should never buy a phone on debt, ever. Go to eBay. Buy the phone you can afford, take it to AT&T, and tell them to put a SIM card in. That's how you get a phone. Don't buy the phone from AT&T. They'll say, it's only $10 a month. Forever! Forever! It never ends! No, don't do that. Don't buy anything on credit. Nothing on payments. Look, the people that are trying to get you to borrow money, they're very slick. They're very clever. They have all kinds of ways of phrasing it where it doesn't sound like debt. It's debt. And it's like bondage. And it's sacrificing your future. And you think, well, it doesn't matter. You know who was like that in the Bible? Esau. Esau came back from hunting. And he gets there and his brother's cooking up some, some stew. And he smells it. He goes, oh, I'm so hungry. Give me some of your stew. And his brother was very clever. He was one of these debt salesmen. He says, I'll give you the stew, but you give me your birthright. And Esau's answer was, well, what's good the birthright if I die? So fine, take the birthright. That's future. Who cares about that? I want what I want right now. I want stew now, so I'll give you my birthright later. He lost the birthright. Do you know how much that is? That is an extraordinary amount of wealth and prestige and privilege. You can't even imagine. And you know what God's response to that was? If you read in Hebrews, God said that Esau was profane because he sold his birthright for porridge. God did not think that was contented. He was like, oh, Esau, he's this humble guy. He doesn't have ambition. And he, and he's, he knows how to be content. That was, not what, well, that was not God's opinion. God's opinion was Esau was profane. And God's response was, I hate Esau. And I love Jacob. That was God's response to this. This idea that you're going to be content and all you care about is like quality family time. You don't need a job. That you have to work a lot of hours. That is not a Christian attitude. It's not a spiritual attitude. It's an attitude that's going to take you to poverty and to debt and to welfare. And you need to try to stay away from that. Now this may not be what you've heard. I hope you've heard this before. I really do. I hope I'm not like breaking new ground with any of you. I hope you've been told this by your parents. I hope you've been told this by your pastors. I hope you've been told this by your school teachers and everybody. But if you haven't, and this is the first time you're really hearing this, well then, maybe we've caught you at the right moment. 
Not too late. Life is serious. And you don't think that a little debt here and a little debt there and a little laziness here and a little laziness there is going to, it is going to add up. And all of a sudden, you're going to be 45 years old, you're going to be $100,000 in debt, and you're going to have no way out. And your life is going to be a waste. And God's going to say, you're profane. I gave you every opportunity to make something of yourself, to vindicate my design, and you wasted it. Don't be that person. Even if the whole world around you is that person. Now this is the good thing about where we're in. If everybody in America thought the way I'm telling you to think, it'd be very hard to live without debt. It's real easy now. You can buy a car for $500 that runs. You say, well how long will it run? It only needs to run one sixteenth as much as one that costs 16, 16 times more. So you can buy a six pack of old cars. And when one breaks, you just get the other one and go. And still come out of here. But if everybody didn't do debt, we wouldn't have used cars to buy. So, you know, it is kind of paradoxical. I mean, because of the way people are consumerism, it makes you can live this life very easily and very well. It's a great thing. And because everybody at your job is basically a loser, I say everybody, many people at your job are, you don't even have to work that hard to be the best and rise to the top. All you have to do is like be there five minutes early, leave 15 minutes late, and never, ever look at your phone while you're working. That would immediately put you on the fast track of management. Immediately. I know, I run a company. I know how low the expectations are. <laughs> it's like he shows up, does he have a pulse, right? Can you look at the flashlight in the eye? Does he have coordination? Huh? Can you clap? We'll make you the boss. <laughs> the bar is set incredibly low. And if you work at it and apply your Christian concepts and principles, you would be more than just a warm body who does what they're supposed to do. You would actually excel. And you want to know what you find when you look at the Bible, people in the Bible, spiritual men in the Bible? They all went to the top. You name me one spiritual man in the Bible who was not the best person in the job. One who did not almost instantaneously rise to the top in any situation and in every position they found themselves in. One spiritual man in the Bible who didn't do that. You can't name a single one. It wasn't because Christians were all fighting to be number one. It's because they had the ambition to live their spiritual life for real. And that translates to success inevitably. Even if you don't want it to. Alright? Well, we'll stop there for now. We're out of time. Next week, we're going to deal with another subject on the seriousness of life. Alright? Take your chairs. Yes. Don't forget the chair. Take my chair.